Fantastic. So while they're making their way up, let me tell you who we have got here today. And I might have to put on my glasses because I'm becoming um, challenged in that area. All right. So we have Dawn Hayward, who is the CEO of the Windsor Academy Trust. We have Heidi Stewart, his, who is the Group Chief Executive at BHSF Group. We have Alex Bishop, who is the National Head of Dispute Re uh, Resolution and Litigation and co-head of Shoesmith Birmingham office. Hello. Hello, welcome, welcome. We have Andrew Walster, who is the director of Street Scene and Regulatory Services for Coventry City Council. We have Professor Paul Noon, who is vi pro vice chancellor, enterprise and innovation at Coventry University, and James Rigby, who is EMEA CEO for SCC. Hello, good morning. How welcome you are. How lovely to see you all. And thank you for putting yourselves in the hot seat. Don't be nervous, it's fine. I don't bite, I'm, I'm very well behaved. <laughs> All right, so what I would love you to do is just very briefly to introduce yourselves. Um, I know I've just said who you are and who you work for, but I would love you to tell me whether you have one assistant, whether you have two assistants, where you fit in with that, the kind of assistant role within your company. And I'm going to start with you. Hello. Thank you. So yes, it's working there, we are wonderful. So um, my name's Dawn Haywood. I have the utter privilege of being the CEO of the Windsor Academy Trust family. We're a family of nine schools that collectively serve 7,000 children um, across, and we have a, a, a thousand staff um, within, within our family. Um, our moral purpose is to unlock the academic and personal potential of young people, and it is an utter privilege. I believe it is um, something I decided I wanted to teach when I was 11. Um, because ultimately it is around making a difference to the lives of young people. And our staff are our most precious people within our family. And our PAs, I have a, I call her my magic weaver. So Rhiannon is um, my PA and she's in the audience today. And there are a group of our executive and head teacher PAs from across our family here Fantastic. today. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely to meet you. Hello. Hi, so uh, James Rigby, I'm the Chief Executive of uh, SCC, so we are an um, IT uh, infrastructure services business based in Birmingham, um, and a uh, family business. We've been uh, going for about uh, 40 years, um, and we employ about um, 8,000 people across Europe, um, many in, in the UK uh, and France, and we also have operations in Spain and Romania. Um, so uh, Faye is here, uh, my, my executive PA, um, worked with me, well worked in the business for many years and we've worked closely together for about the last, about the last five years now. Um, and um, f fantastic um, session by the way, it Thank completely you. resonated with, with many of us I'm sure mm -hmm. about building that, um, that trust really and that relationship, it's all, it, it all starts with that I think. Um, and, and that's certainly, you know, something to see yourself. That's the kind of ethos we try and build into the business. It's all about the people. And once you've got those people bits right, great things happen, I think. I would agree, James. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Oh, yes, it's working. Um, <laughs> I'm Heidi Stewart. I'm the Group Chief Executive at BHSF. I've been in post uh, a year next month. Uh, yeah, so quite a new role for me. Um, BHSF is um, a health and wellbeing provider, so we provide uh, mental health support services in the workplace. We work predominantly with employers. Uh, we provide health cash plans, which is an insurance product, but an affordable product for people to claim cash back on basics like opticians, dentists. Um, and we also provide an occupational health business across the UK and Northern Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 270 staff up and down the country, predominantly in Birmingham. We started out 150 years ago next year. Uh, yeah, originally as a hospital Saturday fund. So by that, it was people who worked in the factories in Birmingham. And if they hurt themselves, they couldn't get access to healthcare way before the NHS. And sadly, a lot of them would die. So what happened was they would work a Saturday and that money would go into a fund, which would then their employer would buy healthcare for them with. Oh, um, so real grassroots from Birmingham, but actually nationwide now. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to do my job. Uh, I couldn't do it without my EA, and, and Katie's here today. Um, she is our head of executive support, and we have a team of EAs in the business that support the directors, and we also have a PA who's recently joined us as well to support with that. And they're the hub of the business. They're the people that make things happen. 
I am not that organised. Um, you know, Katie is always two steps ahead. She tells me where I need to be and what I need to be doing. And, and yeah, I couldn't do my role without her. Yes, I would agree with you. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi, very much indeed. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Andrew Walster. I'm a director from Coventry City Council, the place just down the road, uh, which is twinned with anywhere but Birmingham. Um, <laughs> So I just need to get that out there now that um, I have shown my passport as I've come down the Aston Expressway uh, and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, I agree with everything everybody has said uh, so far about, uh, the, uh, about how an executive assistant supports you. Mine is also somewhere in the audience somewhere. She's already texted me three times while I was stood down the bottom <laughs> to make sure I'd got here and I'd seen somebody and, uh, and, and all the rest of it. Um, it's... Uh, colleagues have spoken about being a real privilege. It's a real privilege to serve in somewhere like Coventry in a city and serve the people that you, uh, you're, you're there to help. Um, most people know about Coventry. I'm not going to talk about it. We've just had a fantastic year as City of Culture. Um, it's been really busy. We're about to go into being a host city for the Commonwealth Games. And on top of that, we're trying to run some services as well, sometimes mm. successfully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Hello. Hello, good morning. So I'm Paul Noon. I'm Pro Vice-Chancellor from Coventry University, the great uh, University of Coventry, uh, 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 working in uh, Andrew's city. Uh, we're a really big university. Our city. Our city. <laughs> our city. I live there too, so yes, it's, our, it's absolutely our city. Um, I, uh, the Coventry University is one of the largest institutions in the UK, incredibly complex. I joined... Uh, the uh, university perhaps seven years ago now, uh, having had no experience of higher education at all. So the support that I had from Kate, Taz, Stacey, all of whom are in this room uh, today, is making me feel a little bit nervous, uh, <laughs> uh, all here, uh, is, is, yeah, it's just, um, it's, it's very difficult to explain how in these really complex organisations where it's difficult to get things done, where my role is absolutely about making collaboration work, making the institution work, making it work for our external partners, uh, that the PAs and EAs that support us uh, have an enormous role to play. And, um, yeah, I, I, it's... It's unimaginable what my life would be uh, if I didn't have Kate organising me, keeping me uh, in the right place, keeping that eye open for what's going on, uh, giving me information about about how the organisation is working, pointing me in the right direction. You know, you need to spend a bit more time in the office, the team need to see you a bit more, and making sure that that happens. Those sorts of things <laughs> are incredibly valuable when you're life is is um, you know mixed up and, and and chasing all over the world and different places so uh, yeah I, I'm enormously privileged to have a team around me uh, Kate in particular but a team around me that support me all the time. Thank you very much indeed and by process of elimination I'm assuming you must be Alex. I am indeed. Hello. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. And can I just apologise so much for being late? Julie, my fabulous PA, knows exactly why. I have a, a six-year-old little boy who was having his induction at his new school today. Oh. And I'm afraid mommy was going to do drop-off. Um, but equally, as Julie knows, I'd committed to, um, to, to present today. So I have just probably broken a lot of speed limits. <laughs> And, and, and nearly broke my heels running into Millennium Point. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, shall I just explain my role? Would that Please help? Do. As, as well as being a mum. Um, so uh, so I, I head up the uh, National Dispute Resolution and Litigation Practice at Shoesmiths. And I'm also co-head of our Birmingham office. Shoesmiths is a law firm. Been around since about 1845. Um, but we have offices all over the UK in... in uh, Scotland, in Northern Ireland, and then right the way down to the South Coast. So that sees me go all over. And I've now um, also taken over responsibility for uh, our Brussels uh, office as well. So um, I'm kept on my toes. And uh, without Julie, I wouldn't be able to do anything. And I certainly wouldn't have made it here today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, what an amazing panel, I think. And I'm th I hope we're going to have a really great conversation. And I am going to just go straight to Andrew because I think I, we should mix it up a bit. Otherwise, I'm going to be going up and down the line. And that could tend to be um, slight. Yes. So I'm going to start with you. And I'm going to ask you about the fact that every assistant has got a really different background. They've come from different firms, whatever. 
Within your firm, what would you say are the skills that your assistant has got that they have bought that really make your role so much easier? So I guess we should get this out here straight away. So the Stacey that Paul mentioned is now my executive assistant. So um, <laughs> she's moved a long way across the city um, <laughs> and, and, and what have you. And actually, part of that is why we employed Stacey is because she'd worked already in a very big, complex, diverse organisation, etc. Um, we often joke that she's actually the deputy director, and, and, and actually she is that... Um, Whilst I may sound and look a little bit like Humphrey Appleby from the local authority, there's a lot of what we do from the really mundane stuff like collecting bins, although that's not exactly mundane in Coventry at the moment. Um, so the really mundane stuff of collecting bins through to running hotels, which is not something you expect local authorities to do, to running waste companies, to planning decisions and, and all the rest of it. There is always something in there that, sorry, is quite frankly going to piss somebody off. And um, as my name goes out in the bottom of most of the letters, Stacey will get those calls and she will get those, those sort of things. And, and actually, um, the ability to then understand who in a, just the bit of the organisation we look after in over a thousand people, who I need to go to, who I need to talk to to go and get that answer and help somebody who needs that help is just phenomenal and probably has a far better memory and mind than I do for the people who work in our organisation. On top of that, we're a political organisation. So being able to understand that the opposition is not always the opposition, it may be the opposition within the controlling group that you need to understand and understand some of the politics that go around that and how you're going to get the best for the people of the city um, within that context is, is absolutely key. Um, I'll shut up in a second. I think the other thing that really that, that um, both Stacey and a number of the colleagues that we've got within our organisation brought to it was working in a variety of different sectors. So we've got people who've worked in, um, in local government, we've got people who've worked in um, higher education, we've got people who've worked in the private sector as well. And, and actually the, the bigger breadth that they can bring to that, the, the better. We then don't end up with um, what I think probably 20 years ago when I started in local government was the, the Alan Bennett office suite type typing pool sort of executive assistant person. Uh, I remember going to watch that with a bunch of colleagues and they weren't laughing and I was. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what they bring. Thank you very much. A, a, an enormous role there, I think. Dawn, I'd like to ask you, is there a structured kind of career progression within your business for assistants? Yeah, so, um, so it's re... My PA is the, I guess, the head coach of our team of, of PAs, um, both for those of them that work with us as an executives um, and also our, within our, our schools, we, our head teachers have PAs as well. So we look at, um, you know, we've got some, with the group that are here today, we've got some that are younger within their career. And I think what's really important is that, and I guess it's, a bit about if we want young people to be the best that we need to, them to be, we need to invest and grow young people. The same applies to our staff. So we can't help our kids to be the best without helping our staff to be the best. And that is a really important, within our strategy, we have five big moves that we're making. And one of those big moves is around investing in our staff and our talent and growing our staff. So that goes from um, young people coming in as apprentices um, young people and helping them and, and Ree herself sits and coaches some of them um, so they come in with administrative roles and we could quickly talk with them around their career aspirations their strengths and start to think about whether they want to be a PA start to give them some of the experiences and opportunities that perhaps they wouldn't have at that stage within their career um, and equally then um, you know, I suppose just supporting them with professional learning, professional development, collaborative opportunities. So one of the most terrifying meetings that takes place in our organisation is when Ring brings, Re brings all the PAs together. Because we know they know absolutely everything about everything yeah. going on in the organisation. And I always pop in and see what they're talking about. But they need the opportunity to learn together as well the opportunity to share the wisdom that they have amongst themselves. But also, it's really important that, um, you know, that we 
I give them and I give Ree the time to do that. Yes, of course, it's about looking after me, but it's more than that. It's about growing the future generation of PAs, executive assistants coming through our organisation as well. Yeah. So we take it very seriously. It's really important. And um, yeah, we want to, to grow talent in the future. I think it's so interesting because so often with assistants, I think they get left out because they don't have their own department. They work in silos across the business. So when HR is ticking, we've done the training of the assistants. They don't tick the box that says we've trained the administrative professionals because they all belong to different departments. So is there, um, I'm actually going to come to Alex, is there a um, training that is specific for the administrators at Smiths? Uh, yes, I mean, I don't know if um, we're special in that regard, but uh, we, we roll out all sorts of training to everyone within the organisation, and there is specific soft skills training as well as technical skills training for all of our PA cohort and, and indeed all of our support staff. Um, so that could be, um, as you, you know, the obvious technical ones in terms of, you know, PowerPoint presentations and, and what have you, but equally... Uh, it could be, you know, the art of persuasion <laughs> or yes. influencing people, communication skills, etc. Um, and I know that, uh, that that Julie certainly certainly partaken of, uh, of the training that we have on offer, and it is important. Uh, and equally, I mean, an, you know, another facet really is that there is no ceiling. You, you talked about is there a career path? Um, you know, I know in in my career, I have seen people join as a PA. One of my PAs in my really early days is now a partner at a law firm mm. in London. Mm. So there are there are different routes available, and we don't shut those doors. They are open to anybody. I think that's fantastic, and I think the fact that you do offer learning and development is probably one of the reasons why Julie won lifetime achievement last year. You know, wow. so, <laughs> wherever she's she also is, pretty special. She is really special. But you know, I also think that giving those assistants the opportunity, well, that. The t there are twofold things there. Firstly, for many assistants, it is their career of choice. It isn't just a job. So when quite often when I start a conference, I say, right, I want you to queue across the room, and we can't do it here, but I want the people who have been in the, pr in the profession for the shortest time over there, and I want the people who have been the longest time over here. And by the time you get about 10 people in, you're at 10 years already. And by the time you get to this end, they've been there 40 years, and they do see it as a career. So yes, I think it's really, really wonderful to be offering an opportunity, and we would obviously encourage that with every business that they were given the opportunity to step into other things. But I think it's also really important to be looking at how within the profession they are able to rise up and to take a career as an administrative professional. James, could you talk to us a little bit about that within your business? <coughs> um, yes, I think, um, you know, I, I, I completely agree. It's, um, you know, if I look at um, some of my EA community, in particular Faye, who, um, who, who has brought through um, a whole cohort of apprentices into that, into that area. Um, it's, it's about, it, again, it's back to building that trust. And, you know, Faye and her team will be involved in all manner of different projects around the business. Um, I, I think in terms of training as well, <coughs> excuse me, um, what I'd say is it's about... So, so you, you, you need to provide all those different elements of training, but some of what you talked about earlier you can't really train. Mm. So uh, some of those core values um, and beliefs and the way you go about things with, with integrity, <coughs> with empathy, um, you can't, it's hard to teach some of that stuff. Um, you know, you've got to be that kind of person. I think, you know, as a, as a, uh, certainly as a leader, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be empathetic with people. You've got to take them with you, take them on a journey. Um, certainly when you're leading a big business, you can't do it all yourself. It's about taking your team with you. So having somebody along your side who, who is able to influence and, 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 and do all that, they're kind of soft skills, aren't they? But they're, you know, you've, got, you've got to demonstrate those skills and be, and be skilled at those things. Um, and I think some of that comes from experience. And you know, it's, gr it's great to see you know, in my business some of, um, some of the apprentices that have come through working with the other executives, people like Faye, um, to see them learn and, and kind of internalise those values. So, you know, as much as, as much as sort of formal training courses, I think that on-the-job training experience, as you said, exposure to um, senior-level executives and, and board meetings, 
that that's I think that's the best training. Very definitely, because for every hour they save you, it drops to the bottom line. Yeah. Mm. That's that's the truth of the matter. Yes. So tell me, Heidi, at your business, is there a structure? So if somebody was to arrive at the company at 18, for example, um, I d and I don't know your structure at all, but if someone was to arrive at 18 and was to decide that they wanted to stay there for the next 40 years, mm -hmm. is there a way that they can see very clearly how they move up as an assistant within your business? Ideally, yes, but we are working on it. So um, <laughs> for a bit of context, um, we're going through a huge program of change, um, as you would expect with a new CEO. Um, and what we've done is focused absolutely, we have three pillars in the business and, and that's deliberately people and culture is first and that's our people internally but also the people we support externally. Um, and one of the things around that is how we ensure that there are clear pathways across all of our job roles in the business. Mm -hmm. We're going through a big piece at the moment across the organisation which will take several months around job evaluation. Mm. Because historically we've not had that and we've had people that are in roles because such and such is good at this. Oh, well, let's give them that as well then. And that doesn't work because we don't give them the skills to then do that as well. So ideally what we want is if somebody was to come in as an admin assistant and thought, actually, I, I really like the look of those EA roles. They can see that clear pathway. But we're training them before they get to applying for it. So they know what the skills are they need in their kit bag. And they can start looking at that now. But we've only just started that. Um, typically, historically, it's been quite a hierarchical organisation, I think it's fair to say. Mm. We're breaking that down, we're changing that. I, one of the things that we've done as part of the job evaluation is taken certain requirements off job descriptions because I don't actually care if my EA's got GCSEs, to be quite frank. I'm more bothered about their values, about who they are as a person, and not every person engages at school. Mm. I don't have that many GCSEs. I'm doing okay, I think, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so actually, why? Why do we do that? We put false barriers in place that stop people progressing, whereas actually what we need to be doing is looking at the person. And that relationship's key. You know, I came into the business and Katie, my EA, was already there. Thankfully, I hope she'd say the same, we get on very well. But actually, it's about that relationship. It's about the dynamics and it's about her ability to understand what I'm thinking, sometimes before I even know what I'm thinking. Um, so, so we're on that journey, I think it's fair to say, but we will get there. It's that anticipation piece, I think, that's yeah. so important. And you're not alone, I think, for most of the businesses that I'm talking to, especially coming out of COVID, it's suddenly becoming more and more important to understand the return on investment of each employee mm -hmm. and to work out how you make sure that they are seeing what excellence looks like so that they can attain it so that the business is getting the most out of them. Thank you for that. That was really a great answer. Paul, I would love to talk to you about how important you think it is for assistants to network with other assistants. Um, very happy to. Uh, so interestingly, uh, Lucy, we've actually brought our assistants into one part of the organisation that sits together so that, they, that they're not uh, sort of um, sat in different departments across the group. Um, uh, some of that is about supporting the training that you were talking about so that it, they don't get lost. Uh, and especially if their executive is perhaps not as engaged in their in their development as others, uh, but also to support this uh, collaboration and communication uh, across the group. M my my role is absolutely about getting the knowledge out of our university, out of the sort of five thousand brains in the staff and the forty thousand students into industry and society, and so. Everything that we do is about that translatory piece between industry and the university. And, and it's not an easy role, I can tell you. Uh, academics can be challenging uh, in terms of talking uh, about what they do and about interacting with business. So the executive support team, the PAs, have to be able to build these relationships across the whole group, have to understand what um, what buttons to press, how to make things happen, uh, and they can't do that if they don't work together on it. It's just impossible. The whole thing would fall apart. So um, the, the support that we get, and it's not just me, it's my colleagues as well, that make the machine, the matrix work. So I, that, we talk a lot about working in a matrix uh, organization. Somebody has to make that work, and the executive support team, the PAs, are crucial. They, they're the oil that makes the matrix 
work. They, they put the energy into it. They make sure that we understand which bits are not working quite right and need tweaking or which bits we need to involve. So uh, it's a absolutely vital and an and absolutely core part of what they do, you know, being able to uh, get the right information, the right person, the right contact to make something work is, is core to the role. Uh, and um, certainly the, the team that supports us is uh, wonderful at it, but it's very important. I am so thrilled to hear you say that. It's something that I'm really banging the drum about at the moment, which is that coming out of COVID, it doesn't matter whether they sit together or not. It's about having a department as opposed to having a network. Because when you have an internal network, it suggests that they are apart from the business. They're not part of the core business. And it means they don't have the structure. They don't have the budget. They don't have the performance review that everybody else in the business does. And actually, it's a department on its own, which is, as all of you have said, so important to the business and to the rhythm of the business and they're sharing best practice and they're getting excited about performing better than each other just like every other department for the very first time and i think that's exciting talk to me please alex about how it is at shoesmith do you have an internal network there well um <laughs> actually down to julie this piece uh, again i mean i told you i couldn't live without her uh, and it's so true so um Within my team, we moved uh, last year to a, a sort of a national team model for dispute resolution. And um, a as a result, Julie and I were chatting about it. We could see so much logic in pulling together a national PA cohort as well. So although they might sit in 13 different locations, getting them to work together was really, really important. Um, and that is something that you know Julie has spearheaded and... Um, at times, it might have been a little bit like herding cats. There were some early adopters. There were some people reluctant to change the way they'd always done things. But um, I think what, what has come out of that, which I think is a, is a huge benefit of uh, working in that sort of team or departmental environment, is the sharing of best practice, the sharing of ideas, uh, collaborating on new projects. Um, and all of that is facilitated by them working together in that way. But the other piece is, you know, equally across the business, that network is phenomenally important to, to, to make everything work internally across departments. Um, it's phenomenally important in uh, making the engine of the entire firm work. And equally, sharing best practice events like today, um, you know, bring those ideas to the organisation. You know, they're welcome. You know, there's, there's no property in a good idea. We'll happily plagiarise it. So, you know, it just... <laughs> Um, that I, I can see huge benefits in, 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 in that engaging piece. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. If I might just say, I think that's uh, important, Lucy, as well, not just for the EA community, but also for the executives as well, because often they need training on how to work with, um, mm. with an EA. I mean, if I look at my own business, that's relatively inconsistent amongst the executives. Mm. Some of them get what we're talking about today, and some of them don't. Mm. You know, they, they are... They, they are in need of some some training and relationship building in the way they go about their business as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a two-way thing, isn't it, in terms of that totally. awareness and training requirement, I think. And, and that is common. The stat was that 78% of the assistants that we surveyed for um, World Administrators Alliance last year said that they felt they were underutilised and that their executives didn't understand how to use them properly. 78%. That is the stat where I tell HR directors and they go, Ugh, because that means there's a whole sector of their business internally who feel that they could be stepping up and doing more. And not in terms of more work, but in terms of taking on more responsibility and really supporting at a higher level. And I think that's, you know, that, that's really important. So talking about the businesses then, Andrew, you heard me talking earlier about leadership meetings and um, assistants attending leadership meetings. Firstly, is that something you do in your business? But secondly, I'd be really interested to know from you how important you think it is that the assistants really do understand the businesses that they're working for. For me, it's absolutely critical um, that, that you can't run an organisation of, of, of any size or any diversity without the, the assistant understanding um, how that business works, who the people are who are going to make things happen, and, and, and how 
uh, the DNA of the organization, uh, the, the organization absolutely works. And I think it's um, certainly within my part of the organization, my executive assistant is part of that same team. She's part of the leadership team that helps me and my colleagues deliver what we need to deliver for, uh, for, for the people of Coventry. And, and it would feel somewhat alien to not have her sat around the table in that, 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 that point and contributing to it. Um, I'm absolutely certain she could probably chair the meeting better than me, um, and she'd probably certainly get more actions out of some of my colleagues, but that's um, that's because some of them are a little bit scared of her, and I think that's fine. Um, so um, it, it is, it, it, it's absolutely key. It, it, you, you can't run an organisation without having that person there. Otherwise, it goes back to the point that colleagues were making earlier, that otherwise the person is removed from, from the organisation. Interestingly, though, we organise our executive assistants in their own department, like the university and like you said. That doesn't mean that they're not part of two or three different teams within, within there. Um, and, and separately, we, we, that, that's the leadership team within the, the city council. We then have two or well, three separate boards of directors for um, arm's length companies. And again, my executive assistant sits in those boards of directors as well um, for, for, for that, re that same purpose. I think that's wonderful. I think that deserves a round of applause. I think really fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. So how do you think then, and I am going to come to you, Dawn, now, how do you think you can encourage your assistants to take a place at the leadership table? And I'm not just talking about the physical table now. I'm talking about stepping up into more of a leadership role. Yeah. So um, if I go back a little to conversation just a, a moment ago, um, so, firstly, I think it's about giving them confidence, them knowing that they are a critical part of the organisation and the leadership of the organisation. And I think there is a, a real responsibility for us to grow them to be the best that they can be. And I'm really proud of the team um, in, in our family where we've been looking at how do we make teachers, so we know that instructional coaching for teachers is the most impactful, research-grounded approach to enabling teachers to be great teachers. So what we've, what we've done is to say, well, how do we take the principles of instructional coaching and innovate with our team of PAs um, and our administrators? And so we've been working with Your Excellency and with our, because uh, we, we do some writing and on national platforms around instructional coaching for teachers. So we've brought those two groups together with our, with our team to look at how do we ensure that we have a, a, an approach to instructional coaching with, with all of our executive teams. So there's a, a pilot that's taking place naturally, nationally with, within the organisation that we're monitoring and looking at the, the impact of this. And it's simply a model of see it, name it, do it. And that is with staff, them spending time with each other, they're seeing things that are great and giving positive feedback on that, but also identifying where they could be that little bit better with a little bit of support. And then you're naming that specific area, and then there is some intentional practice that goes alongside that. So before they go and practice it for real, they have the opportunity to practice those things amongst them, amongst themselves. So I think there's, you know, the, the investment in our, st in our executive assistants to be the best that they can be and the best leaders they can be. It doesn't happen by accident, becoming a leader. Yeah. We have to intentionally develop and support the leadership development skills of our executive, executive assistants. And so I think encouraging them to be leaders within the organisation is, number one, knowing how important they are. And it isn't just about investing in leaders in the organisation or teachers in the organisation or others, but actually knowing they are a valued and critical and important part of the organisation. And really importantly, giving confidence and giving opportunities. And sometimes it's also, it's just asking and listening. You know, it's, you know I, Re knows more about me than my mother knows about me. <laughs> um, but also, she knows more about the organisation than the vast majority of people within our organisation and our family. Because she listens, she's connected, she understands, she, and she will challenge me sometimes. And that's important, but I need to give her permission to do, well I don't, because she'd just do it anyway. But, um, 
But I also need to be humble enough to know that sometimes there are things I need to learn and get better at too. Yes, and I think being a CEO is quite a lonely job too, actually, isn't it? So to have somebody that does challenge you occasionally, or in Fran's case, a lot, <laughs> my assistant, but, you know, she will say to me, why have you agreed to do that? Are you mad? You're exhausted. You're going to go and do the training and they're going to say she's rubbish because you're so tired. And I go, OK, all right, well, yes. James, I'm going to ask you that same question about how we encourage our assistants to step up into leadership. And the reason I'm asking you that as well is because I think you're both from two very different yeah. um, types of organisation. And I'd be interested from a more commercial point of view to hear your point of view. Yeah, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's both things that, that, that Dawn said, really. It's, A, a the organisation has to provide the <clears throat> environment for uh, opportunity. Um, and... Certainly, you know, in the exposure that the EAs have in our business, as you say, in board meetings and all sorts of um, issues, they are hearing lots of things. They're taking the temperature gauge of the business. They're involved in all sorts of, pro hearing about all sorts of projects. So out of that will come opportunity. If you expose yourself, as you said before, at that level, you'll find, you know, you'll, you'll come across opportunities and, um, and, and the executive need to have the, need to provide those opportunities and you know certainly for me I mean Faye is as important an executive to me as any of my board mm. you know so I would, I'm absolutely um, delighted to be able to uh, get, get her involved in, in all sorts of projects you know I mean if I look at things like ESG um, big issue for corporate businesses at the moment Faye's very involved in that the whole diversity and inclusion thing but it's also I think I would say and, and Faye does this but um, have the confidence to stick your hand up as well. Mm. Um, you know, you have, if you've got that relationship with your, you know, with your executives, you know, you, you will, don't forget how important you are to them and, and have the confidence in that to be able to say, listen, I can help you with this. Mm. Um, because, you know, often they're rushing around here, there and everywhere. Um, you know, you, you'll, be, you'll be one of the most trusted people they have. So they will be more than happy to listen to you if you stick your hand up and ask. I think that's a great answer because I know that for many of the assistants who are at a really senior level, that is where they get stuck because it's, OK, so I've got to the highest point that I can within this company as an assistant. What can I do now? What is now open to me to keep me challenged, to keep me feeling like I am growing? Because we all need that self actualization piece, <laughs> don't we? Heidi, is there advice that you would be giving to an assistant who wasn't sure where to go because they've got absolutely to the top level? What kind of opportunities are there open to them within your organisation? So <clears throat> I think our, our assistants, our, our EAs, are in a really privileged position in some respects in that they get to see all of the business. And I think it's our role as CEOs to encourage them to think about where their next steps go, given they've had all that insight. So if an EA came to me and said, actually, I'm really interested in looking at that area, I would actively encourage that. Now, if they want to stay within their role as an EA, it's a different discussion around, well, how do we develop your skills? What else do you need? What's missing from that? Whether that's going and doing an MBA or whether that's doing some people skills training. It has to be down to the individual and it has to be personalised to them, first and foremost. But I would encourage any EA to think that they have so much more insight than anyone else in our business. They get to see all the departments. They know more about what's going on than most of the execs most of the time. And actually, that use that insight to think about your next steps and where you want to go. And I also think be brave, because unless you put your hand up and say, actually, I want to try that, or here's a thought, nobody's going to hear you. And if the, if the organisation turns around and says, no, you're probably in the wrong organisation, because if they value you, they will encourage that. Mm, yes, I would totally agree. OK, let's get into the thorny subject of remote working just for a moment, because I know that, you know, obviously the press is full of um, businesses needing people to come back to the office or work remotely or whatever it happens to be. Are your assistants still working remotely, first of all? And secondly, if they, are, all, are your assistants, some of them working remotely or are they all back in the office now, firstly? Hybrid. Hybrid, great. So what I'm wanting to know then, and I'm going to come to Alex first, is... 
If you have assistants who are working um, remotely or a hybrid situation, how would you um, go about making sure the communication was correct? Yeah, really good question. Um, I think fundamentally, it comes down to trust. And you know, personally, I trust our PA cohort to get the job done. And they're delivering. They delivered in the most extraordinary circumstances. I'm sure everyone on the panel would, would attest over the last couple of years. Um, th they are absolutely delivering. In terms of keeping that communication piece open, again, I think it's about knowing each other um, and knowing, as, as, as I think you know, what COVID has taught me, is how every individual responded to COVID differently, how every individual had very different needs, wants, concerns, what have you. And you have to start to get to know each other, whether that's you know, your EAs, PAs, or vice versa with the, the partners or the lawyers, in my case, that you're looking after. You've got to understand what works for them because it may be that a fixed time of day doesn't work for them for a catch-up or a fixed time of week. It may be that <clears throat> it is slightly more ad hoc. It may be partly by email and partly on a Teams call, uh, what have you. And I think it's about having that communication, having that conversation, understanding each other, um, and uh, uh, and trying to work out how is that going to work best for you. Mm. You've got to, I think it's it's harder than ever to communicate um, on one level, and it's easier than ever on another with the technology that's being facilitated. So, you know, fundamentally, if the, tr if the trust is there, I think you can make it work. But I don't think that there is, um, this is the solution. I think it is so dependent on the individuals concerned in every case. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. Most of the assistants I talk to fall into one of two groups. So you've either got the ones that are saying, oh my word, I've got so much work to do and I don't know how to do it. And a lot of it's stuff I haven't done before. And the other half of, and, and, and where they're saying that, I'm saying to them, well, actually the last recession showed that assistants were given all sorts of other things to do and that created opportunity. The other half of them are coming and saying, I don't think they know I'm here at all. Nobody's talking to me. I don't know what I'm meant to be doing. And in that case, I'm telling them to get a grip, really. <laughs> and saying, you know, <laughs> with love, of course. <laughs> but uh, no, my, <laughs> no, but my point is that the executives are in an unprecedented situation right now. And I hate that word, but I can't think of another one. And really, they're out saving the world. They've got to go and reinvent the world of work for their businesses. In some cases, they're saving the businesses totally. So they don't have time to think about what you're doing as well as what they're doing. They want you to go and do the thing and free up their time so that they can go and do the job of work that they are trying to do. But I think communication is absolutely at the heart of that. And to me, if the assistant understands what the priorities are for today, they can go and get on with supporting you at the highest level. It's a, so often I, when I'm talking and there are communication problems, it's because it's going backwards and forwards on email or WhatsApp, as opposed to actually getting in front of somebody so you can see the body language and hear the tone and pace and pitch of voice. And that communication piece to me is so important. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think what, what, what's so important there in terms of the skills, one of the most important skills, I think, actually for anyone in the world of work going forward is that emotional intelligence and being able to spot where that email traffic is not going to get you anywhere and you need to change that, that kind of emotional intelligence, I think, is going to be critical for, for all of our EA cohort going forwards. Yes, definitely. Paul, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, I think it's, it's been a... Uh, so so I, I guess, first of all, you know, March two years ago, we all got sent home and had to uh, make it all work. And the PAs and the EAs uh, made that happen. You know, we, we were able to... Uh, find ways of meeting and engaging with each other uh, that worked. It kept kept the business alive, I guess. Just kept us uh, treading water. I think uh, some colleagues it was it were very comfortable with it. Certainly in that first lockdown, seemed to manage quite comfortably. Others uh, were uh, really <laughs> struggling with being alone and not having that uh, stimulation uh, of their colleagues. Um, and, and others were just dealing with uh, family difficulties, children not at school, et cetera, and, and all of that was very difficult. So I think we navigated our way through that, and the PAs were absolutely vital in, in, in understanding the temperature of the organization, in, in supporting the communication uh, uh, through that time. 
So we, we sort of fast forward to a time when it is more possible to, uh, uh, to be face to face. And I'm personally, and I may get booed, I like doing the face to face stuff. I think we miss, I think we get an enormous amount uh, from being in a room together. I think it supports creativity. It allows us to move the organization forward. And that doesn't mean that uh, sort of flexible, agile ways of working are not absolutely uh, uh, used and, and work very well for certain things, but for other things, actually, the, the face-to-face stuff uh, really works. And, and just on that communication side, I think, well, so my, my team are perfectly happy to sort of have an intervention and say, Paul, we need to have a talk about this, something's not working, uh, and I really welcome that. It's, it's vital that I get that feedback uh, and uh, then it allows me to uh, make a decision or to support a decision uh, uh, to, to move the, the problem forward. That, that's because, you know, sometimes I just don't see it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the problem uh, and, uh, it, you know, they, they do see the problem and they can help me uh, through that. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I guess a lot of the things we've talked about are in, in the hands of the of the PAs. They, they are crucial at getting training uh, out across the organization, at getting communication out and, uh, uh, and making teams work. Uh, so they have a really important role to play in making all of this work and uh, we need to support them to be, able to, to be able to do that. I agree and I think sometimes they forget that they have the power in their hands. I can remember doing a, another CEO panel a while back in New York and uh, one of the questions that I've been asked to ask the CEOs was, how do I stop them from taking me off their calendar? And the CEO started blinking and went, but don't they manage the calendar? And it turned out that the assistants were taking themselves off the calendar because they didn't think that they were the most important thing and therefore they were causing themselves problems rather than the executive saying, well, I don't want to see you at the moment. You know, my assistant arrives as a chain of people who come and see me over a week and when she arrives, I don't go, what are you doing here? You're not important. You know, she's just another one of the meetings that I have. So don't take yourself off the calendar. <laughs> We were talking a moment ago about assistants feeling like they weren't seen, especially during COVID. And I think for many assistants, especially if you look at the research I was talking about earlier, they're feeling that they don't feel they're being best utilised and that the businesses don't understand what it is that they do. How do you think, and I'm going to come to you, Andrew, we can raise the profile of assistants within businesses and we can make sure that the people who work within the businesses understand what the assistant is capable of and that it isn't just tea and typing? So, so it's, that's quite a big question, isn't it? Because actually, um, I think quite a lot of people are very aware of what Stacey can do because she tells them um, on, on a fairly <laughs> frequent basis. Um, Good on you, Stacey. And, and, <laughs> uh, and, he's, and, and he's not, and rightly, he's not backward in coming forward on, on that. But if I think across the whole cohort of executive assistants that we have within the organisation, that isn't, obviously isn't true for everybody. And I don't think... Um, the, the the profile is necessarily raised across the whole of the organisation as well as it could be. So I think that that's the, 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 the piece of honesty. I'd like to just touch on the point of flexible working, if please I do. can. Is that allowed please to do. go off the question? I'm bringing slightly. you back, but please Yeah, do. OK, that's fine. <laughs> um, so uh, I, this is really interesting, and I'm probably not going to hold to my company line on what we should be doing on coming back to the office and all the rest of it, having just announced discounted car parking and all the rest of it. Um, I, so th there are two things. I, my business that I run is based in at least five different places. So I am never in one place. So the, the chances of uh, us managing to meet face to face are are not always as easy as they uh, as they uh, as they have been in the past. But also, we've just been through two years of the biggest experiment in how people should work ever. And if we give away that opportunity to change how we work as a society uh, and as organisations, then we're, we're stupid. I, I, there is nothing... You know, the amount of... I've obviously upset somebody and turned it off. <laughs> um, if you looked at the, uh, the amount of traffic 
drop during lockdown and all of that. I'm not suggesting we should go back to, you know, um, tumbleweed blowing across streets and all the rest of it. But actually, if we look at the challenges that we have got as a society in climate change and how people live their lives and how people travel, etc., then actually we need to rethink about how people work. And, and, and absolutely, we should be measuring people on their output, not their presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. presentation within the, uh, mm -hmm. within the organisation. Sorry, do you want me to go back to your original question now, Lucy? <laughs> no, I'm going to say to you that I think that's a really, really important point. And going back to my presentation a moment ago when mm. I was talking about goals, everything I'm reading is saying that whereas it was nine to five and it was about being yeah. in the organisation from nine to five, and that, by the way, was invented by Ford in his factories, yeah. it's going to become more how about here's this, the goal. And how let's many of this panel goal. work nine to five? None of us, I suspect. No. And how many people out there work nine to five? Nobody, I suspect. I certainly know that, you know, I have spoken to my executive assistant on a Saturday and a Sunday to get stuff done. And, and, and that's, um, you know, that's not very frequent, thankfully, for her. But um, it's, uh, you know, we don't work in a nine to five pattern. Life does not work in a nine to five pattern. It hasn't done for years. We're, we're kidding ourselves on a flexi time nine to five presentationism the the juxtaposition of that has always got to be though that we can't just rely on people's good nature to continually work them for every hour that that, no. that is there people have got to have their downtime as well no and i think as, lo as long as we have clear goals and expectations then as long as those goals are achieved whether that's you and your executive working together as an assistant or whether that is the assistant having their own goals to go and work on i think that's going to end up being much more important yeah. Lucy, is it okay to just come in now? Jump in, the, by all means. This? It's, um, so within education, we were in a slightly different position um, where throughout the pandemic, all of our schools stayed open all of the time. Um, and that was really scary for a lot of people, actually. We needed to be there in our schools to ensure that the children, um, that the, particularly some of our most vulnerable young people, um, and also certainly to enable parents to be able to go to work to enable the children of key workers to be able to go to work. And what I would say is that what I saw in our family at that time was the most incredible sense of collective efficacy. And what I mean by that is that um, without having to be asked to do things, people did the most extraordinary things. So we had PAs who were here today and executive assistants who were here today who were out delivering food parcels to some of our young people on free school meals. We, were, we have people here who set up some of those almost field hospitals to ensure that we could test young people for COVID before they came back into school at the start of term and all those sorts of things. There were extraordinary things that, that all of our family did, but especially our PAs and our executive assistants. Executive PAs have a knack of knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And that is exactly what they did, and I will be for eternally grateful for the leadership they showed, because other people followed them. They just did it. Mm. And I think that's something to be incredibly, you know, incredibly proud of them, of them for. And the other thing I would just say is that, um, you know, there's a lot that's spoken about, and you'll hear it in the press around the COVID kids, the COVID <coughs> generation, everybody's behind. Um, we have a slightly different take on that because they're not. Some are, but most of them aren't. But when we, there, when we look at the pandemic, there is almost a deficit from it. There is a how bad it was and we all need to recover from it. That's the discourse that you hear out there. And our language is one of let's emerge stronger from it. Mm -hmm. Let's take the lessons that we've learned, the incredible innovation that we saw throughout that period of time, and the use of digital technology is simply one of those things. So how do we balance the face-to-face -face that's critical, but how do we very intentionally weave in the use of digital technology to ensure that all thrive and all flourish? I couldn't agree more with you. And actually, I spoke to one of your assistants, and they were so passionate about what they did, it made me cry, really. I mean, just extraordinary work they did over that period of time. However, I think it also comes back to the question and the stuff we were talking about before, because I was speaking quite recently to a business who has 48 assistants. They have eight vacancies. They have five who are off long-term sick because of stress. 
and they have six on the watch list. Mm. And he was saying, the HR director that I was speaking to, that his problem is that over the course of COVID, so many of the assistants stepped up and went above and beyond. And the executives got used to doing 10 to 12 meetings a day as opposed to eight to 10. And because we were in that almost wartime spirit of going, we have all got to dig down and we've got to do the thing, everybody gave their best. And now they don't know how to step back and go, enough now. Mm -hmm. And they're burning out all over the place. I'd be really interested in your opinion on that, Alex. Gosh, um, you're absolutely right. And I think you know, 2020 in particular was just an extraordinary year. And you saw so many examples across the business of people doing extraordinary things. I'm sure we could all think of them. Um, I literally, last week, was going through our, our partner appraisals. It's a joy this time of year. Um, going through our partner appraisals and reflecting on, you know, in any year... Lucy, in any year, I will expect an instance of you know long-term sickness or a horrible diagnosis or somebody with a mental health issue. The sheer scale of those issues manifesting this year is just unprecedented. I've never seen anything like it. And I, I absolutely know that that's COVID and it's the stress and the build-up that manifests physically as well as mentally and emotionally on people. Um, and, and I think we'll be living with this for for, for a while, actually. Um, and it will it will hit at different times for different people, depending on where they are on the journey. Um, so, look, it's something that um, it, we're already we're already seeing in my business. We have seen in my business people with long COVID, people with cancer diagnoses, etc. That I am convinced are related. People ha taking time off with stress. Um, it, it's why, and actually, again kudos to, to Julie here. You know, mental health it, 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 in particular is, it is really, really important that we focus on. We have a mental health and wellbeing day at Shoesmiths. Um, and you know, we, we really try and encourage people to talk about some of the challenges that they have. Um, and we, we, we also signpost where people can get help as much as we possibly can. Um, I, I think we're only at the beginning, Lucy, of, of, of how this is manifesting. I totally agree. The, the World Economic Forum is saying that for the future of work, 50% of the workforce is going to need to be retrained. Um, and I think obviously with the new world of work and us creating it as we go along, that's going to be really important. I know that many of the assistants feel that they don't sit within the rest of the business when it comes to asking for training. And certainly I know that there are a large number of people here today who have paid for their own training rather than going and asking, or their business has said, no, we won't pay for you, so they've taken a day off and have paid for themselves to attend. And certainly my experience when I'm running training courses and things is that very often they say, can I pay over a period of months because I will pay for myself. What would you say to those assistants? Within your companies, would they have the opportunity if they asked for training to go for it? Or is it, is it something, in other words, that they're conjuring in their heads? And should they feel more confident about asking? I'm just going to go along the panel and start here with Dawn, and we'll just go along and see what you have to say. So the first thing I'd say is go and work for somebody else. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, look, everybody deserves to be the best that they can be, no matter what their role is within the organisation. And I mean, you know, for us, that includes cleaners, catering staff, anybody. Everybody is equally important. Everybody has their role to play. So I think that it's critical that we invest in staff and growing our staff. It's through doing that that the magic happens, as you said earlier, and we accomplish what, we, what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it shouldn't be a, um, a thing that you necessarily have to go and ask for. It should be something that is just there. It's something that is actually an expectation of the organisation that you work within. You know, we can all get better, and that's not because we're not good enough, but because magical things happen when we do, and that includes me. We all need to learn. We all need to be humble enough to know that things that we can get better at. And we need to have a culture where we can actually be confident enough to say, actually... I'm not sure about that, as well as, you know, so could I have some, you know, could I spend some time with you on that? Because professional learning isn't just courses, and it isn't just conferences. Mm -hmm. It's about intentionally understanding where people are, what they're great at, 
what their passions are, what their talents are, what their interests are, and being very intentional about supporting people to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Jane. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, a couple of things. I'd say um, I, I'd like to think that training is widely available in our business, you know, uh, and, and can most of the time be satisfied. Um, I'd say there are other forms of informal forms of training as well. So, you know, mentoring, talking to um, other people within the organisation, other EAs, as you say that, you know, if you're if you're not a department and you're a network, use the network. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, adopt adopt some of that some of that training from other other people within the business. Um, and I think probably thirdly, just um, get your sales hat on as well with whoever the decision maker is around that training. Right, if that's your executive, spend time with him or her and convince them of the need for it. So, so take matters into your own hands a bit, mm. I guess, and, and convince them of why it's needed and how you can be more productive or help them better if you had access to that training. Make a proper business case. Exactly. That's what everybody else does. Talk yeah. about the return on investment it's going to bring to the business yeah. as opposed to why you want to do it. Exactly. And I think, it's, again, it's back to that having time with the exec um, on such matters. Not, you know, um, here's your meetings for next week and I've, you know, done all your travel, that, which is what, as I say, some executives want. Um, you ask, th ask them for more time than that. Mm. Um, as you said earlier, to cover things like strategy, KPIs, um, and, and personal development. Mm. You know, those things come out of spending time together. Um, and as, as I say, my experience, a lot of executives need help with that. And I'm not talking about sort of six monthly reviews. This is, you know, half, even if it's just half an hour a week, you know, you need to be asking for that with your execs to get these sort of conversations going. And I think mm. training is a key part of that. And I think training the execs too. I don't know about you, the very first time I had an assistant, I went home and I went, oh, I got given an assistant. It was a status symbol. I had no clue what to do with her at all. <laughs> she taught me. <laughs> Heidi. Um, I, I would echo uh, what's already been said and, and particularly Dawn's point, you're probably in the wrong organisation. And I think it is difficult at the moment. You know, a lot of businesses are struggling with the current economic climate. But actually, I think it's, it's our role as CEOs to kind of flip the pyramid. And what I mean by that is, organizations always seem to manage to find the funding for the top of the pyramid mm. and to invest in them and actually flip it round because for every one executive that you can give a Cranfield management course, which all have their merits, but actually the investment in that could probably train 10 people if you flip the pyramid. So that's what I would encourage us to do as a collective. But also, you know, I was horrified to find out that my EA previously used to pay to attend this. I just think that's, I can't get my head around it. I think you have to absolutely support. Uh, and, and it's not expensive. I'm not saying you should put your prices up. But, well, you know, <laughs> if you think about that in terms of the value it brings back to the business, then, then it's absolutely worth its weight in gold. Yes, and I think that's really important too. I mean, it's, you know, I, I was talking last night, and I know that some of you weren't here, but there was an organisation we just worked with who has 500 assistants, and we did a reorg for them, we put training in place, we got the structure in place for skills development, and the savings to the business that they calculated just by saving their junior management one hour a week, mm -hmm. that's 500 assistants saving one hour a week for their junior management, was an $88,000 a week saving for that business. So, you know, it's... It's, a, I think, a false economy to not being educating the assistants. I am just going to go to the end because this is our final um, question and I would like each of you to have a chance to answer this or to leave them with something. So, I, I, yes, we have training available and it's something that we, we, we support. I, I just think we underestimate sometimes the power of decent and, and sensible mentoring, both being mentored and being a mentor in, in itself. So uh, our executive assistants are probably some of the better mentors that we can provide to people because they know the breadth of the organisation. Um, and my most e recent experience of this is probably this Monday, we interviewed and gave a job to a colleague, wasn't an executive assistant, but somebody who I've known 15 years, who spent the last year, five years being mentored by somebody in the police. Um, and she got a job on Monday as a financial director in one of our arms length companies. And that's somebody who's, who's worked with the organisation and that mentoring has changed that person's 
view on life probably in the last sort of two or three years. And I think it's something that can be really powerful that, that, that we need to support as well. And I'd always recommend people being mentored outside of an organisation. Because yes, you as an organisation will get more potentially from that than, than you will. Not that internal mentoring isn't a good thing, but mm. you'll get more from that as well. And I think that's the power of an organisation like this, actually, a network like this, because the thing we hear from assistants more than anything else when they attend events is, oh, my goodness, it's not just me. Thank goodness. I thought it was just me that had that issue, and now I've got other people, and they've all got all sorts of solutions to how I deal with that. Paul? Uh, I, I guess you would expect as a, a learning organisation that uh, we, we would want to support our uh, colleagues to grow and to develop um, and I think we do see quite a lot of that. I guess my message is that uh, have the confidence uh, to say actually I'd like to do this, I, I'm interested in this, this is something that would help me in my career, help me to support you, to support the organisation because the executive might not come up with it by themselves. You, I think you are in a very powerful position to influence and to say actually we're missing something here and we could do something so i would encourage you to do it certainly the people that uh, i work with uh, are not shy in coming forward and having those conversations but i really value them because i might just not know uh, and so have that confidence be be prepared to challenge yourself i thought your uh, message earlier about being out of your comfort zone is where you really uh, create the magic is absolutely right and uh, uh, encourage you to keep doing that. Thank you, Paul. And last but by no means least, Alex. Oh, pressure. Um, <laughs> so look, the, the day we stop learning is the day we ought to just give up. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the, the sort of primary message here. Um, like uh, James, you know, hopefully we do provide an awful lot of training in-house, but again, kind of Lucy's point really, make the business case and it may not be just for you. It may be that actually it's a business case to introduce an element of training that your firm isn't currently offering that the entire PAEA cohort could benefit from. And there are economies of scale in, in doing that. So if that isn't available, um, that would be the sort of thing that I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to, to have a look at. Um, as you say, kind of training 10 rather than one um, makes more sense. Uh, and my final message to you all is just massive thank you because genuinely we, I'm sure, could not do what we do without you. You're all utterly amazing, incredible human beings. So massive thank you from me to, to you and to Julie in particular, wherever she might be. <laughs> oh, wouldn't you agree they've been amazing? Thank you so much for all your insights. Thank you so much. Really, really useful session.